Hello, everyone, and welcome to our AI and L&D session. My name is Nick. I'm going to introduce myself properly in just a moment. Uh, whilst we're waiting for people to arrive there, we did have a quick little mentee uh, discussion forum going on. What, what do you think uh, AI is going to impact in the world of L&D? Um, myself, uh, I've personally worked uh, in sort of instructional design or in, in learning design for about 15 years, uh, and it's certainly revolutionizing a lot of the tasks uh, that were very, very time consuming uh, and automating a lot of different things for me. But we can see uh, quite a bit here in sort of reporting and analytics, uh, of course, using AI as a data analyst, uh, creating bespoke learning. So things like customized learner pathways, uh, creating content, of course, TNAs or training needs analysis, uh, perhaps how you conduct surveys or you analyze existing training data from your LMS or your LXP uh, and pump that in to try and identify skills gaps. Um, preparation. Yeah, that's quite a good word to, to come in as well. Uh, the idea that maybe uh, AI might not necessarily do all of the work for you, but it might be, give you a really good foundational uh, starting point, um, particularly when it comes to uh, brainstorming and coming up with different ideas. So a few good answers in there. Um, we are going to, over the next 45 minutes or so, take a look. I'm going to introduce you to some of the tools that I uh, I'm using every day um, from an L&D perspective to really expedite and automate a lot of the tasks, uh, again, that typically take me a lot of time. Now, we can see lots of familiar faces in here. We do have a very, very busy session today. Um, for those that haven't met me before, my name is Nick Villani. I'm the co-founder uh, of Edify Academy. Uh, and like I mentioned before, I've spent the last sort of uh, 15 years or so working in the space of L&D, um, working with some of the biggest organizations in the world, largely around topics like digital transformation, um, I'm very, very deeply passionate about technology, but not technology for technology's sake, uh, more the impact of technology on people and culture uh, and the way in which teams need to kind of embrace change and innovate constantly. I founded Edify about eight months ago. Um, and just to give you a really broad introduction to us, to us, uh, we are an AI skills training company. We really sit at the center point uh, or the intersection of these five pillars. Um, so there's a lot of AI training companies out there that focus really deeply on technical skills, you know, or on data analysis um, or data science. Um, we, of course, have specialists in those fields, um, but in many ways, we also think people, culture, processes, procedures, governance, ethics, these things are just as topical when it comes to understanding how AI is going to impact your role, your team, and your business. Uh, so a lot of the training work that we do there is really centered around these. Towards the end of the session today, I will also tell you a little bit about one of the programs we've designed recently, which is specifically um, for L&D professionals. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the things that, that you can expect from that. But I really just want to get into things. Uh, we're going to share loads of different links with you today, loads of different tools, loads of different resources. Um, we're not affiliated with any of these platforms. Um, but hopefully uh, you walk away after the next 45 minutes with some nuggets or some things that you can go and try out for yourself. Before we get into that, um, I just want to share this, this model with you. It comes from, from BCG Group. Um, but thinking about the role of AI, um, AI broadly or specifically generative AI can be categorized into kind of five different areas. Um, there are situations, uh, of course, where AI can completely automate something for you. Um, that might be a matter of creating a custom GPT. Uh, it might be around using a specific tool um, within your LMS or within your LXP that, that completely automates things. There are other situations, though, maybe where AI doesn't have all of the answers. Uh, and this is more what I like to refer to as kind of augmentation. So how can the human and the machine work together, uh, whether that's deciding on things or summarizing materials, whether it's giving recommendations, uh, whether, again, it's just sort of brainstorming ideas, or whether it's just dumping information and then asking AI to evaluate it for you. As an L&D person, um, it's really critical that you start to think about the types of tasks or the types of jobs that you're doing day in and day out. You know, whether that's drafting session plans, uh, whether that is conducting training needs analysis, whether that is looking at the impact of training that you've, that you've run, um, whether it is about building up facilitation guides or um, e-learning. Uh, generative AI is rapidly uh, shifting and reshaping the way that you should be approaching these tasks. And when we think about generative AI specifically within the world of LND, and we got a lot of this out of the word cloud at the start, 
Um, but some of the key areas with the clients that we're working with at the moment, where they're really interested in exploring the impact of, of AI, uh, are largely around these kind of five things. So one is sort of skills mapping, you know, recognizing uh, gaps within the organization, dumping in qualitative and quantitative data to understand, you know, where there might be training needs and what those needs look like. The second is around content generation. Uh, of course, like I mentioned before, that could be anything from you know, learning outcomes to session plans, to facilitation guides, to e-learning, to, to decks, to flashcards, that kind of thing. Um, creating adaptive learning pathways. Uh, if you missed our last webinar, uh, we were uh, co-hosting with Hive Learning. Uh, they have a fantastic platform, uh, community-based sort of uh, AI-powered uh, platform that really helps you create sort of customized learner pathways. Knowledge discovery, um, that could be for you conducting your own research or also allowing um, your whoever your customers are, whoever your students are, to find the information that they need. Uh, and then, of course, very, very importantly, and we can see this happening a lot, but around talent pipelines and retention, impact on attrition. Uh, of course, as AI starts to automate a lot of the sort of the blue collar work that's out there, it is really rapidly reshifting uh, and refocusing the way in which organizations need to hire uh, talent and the way in which people spend their time uh, doing work. Because suddenly if AI is automating a lot of it for you, uh, then that enables a lot more strategic or creative thinking. Uh, so really uh, as an organization or as an L&D team, if you're working within a big corporation, uh, really thinking about how that's going to impact you in the short, mid, and the long term. Now, throughout the session today, we do have Q&A live. So if you've got any questions for me, um, this is a little different to our other sessions because normally we have a special guest in, but I'm going to run today myself. Um, but please drop them into the Q&A and we'll try and pick those up uh, towards the end of the session. In practice, when you look at sort of AI, there's some pretty sensational headlines out there. Now, you might have seen this towards the end of last year, Octopus Energy in the UK, uh, very publicly said that they were starting to use AI um, to replace customer service agents. Uh, the most alarming stat here is that the satisfaction score, the CSAT, um, of the emails that were being written by AI, that were using the OpenAI API to do this, um, had 80% customer satisfaction, which was actually 15% higher uh, than it was from the trained, skilled people. Now, that's quite an alarming stat. I mean, if you think about, uh, if you are in a company that has customer service and you're thinking about training and development for these people, um, what is AI actually going to do to their roles? Uh, I often say, um, and something that is a cornerstone of all of our programs here, is that AI won't necessarily replace you, but the chances are that someone who knows how to use AI probably will. Uh, and even just being in the session today, being open-minded, trying to learn a little bit more about some of these tools will hopefully uh, be really useful for you in your path to starting to open your eyes to this technology uh, and see not only what it's capable of, but also some of its limitations. Another great example, um, loads of news uh, around them at the moment is Sana Labs. If you've not come across them before, uh, it's really uh, fully automated. We'll, we'll drop the link to the chat. We'll drop the link to Sana Labs in the chat fully automated sort of e-learning uh, platform um, that delivers kind of end-to-end, -end, but AI powered the whole way through. Uh, obviously very, very fast scaling company um, that uh, is one to watch. You know, if you're still trying to build uh, or you're in a position where you don't necessarily have a learning management system in place and you're looking to do that and you want to do so in an AI powered way, I definitely recommend checking out Sana Labs. Uh, Louis will share the link to Sana Labs there in the chat with you in, in case you want to take a look at that. But let's talk specifically about L&D teams uh, and some of the ways in which I think you can start using generative AI uh, immediately. Uh, and we're going to go through each of these. Again, I'm going to introduce you to some tools. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of ideas. I'll do a couple of live demos as we go. Um, there are There is obviously so much, so much uh, that, that AI is actually capable of. We're only going to scratch the tip of the iceberg uh, in the session today. Uh, again, like I said, towards the end of the session, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the deeper kind of design tasks where AI can assist. Uh, and of course, if you'd like to have a further chat with me about that, uh, we can set up some time and do that separately. But four key things we're going to talk about today. So uh, again, probably things if you're, an, if you're a learning designer, um, you're probably doing these on, on a daily, if not a weekly basis. So one is around so conducting research. Uh, again, that could be subject matter research, or that could be research within your organization, using your own data to find out information. 
Uh, the summarization of content, uh, obviously we're swimming in a sea of content. Uh, so whether that's kind of white papers uh, or instructables or videos that you're seeing out there, uh, again, I'll introduce you to a couple of tools and frameworks that will allow you to do that. The creation of content, I dare say everyone on this call today has probably played around with tools like ChatGPT or Claude uh, or Gemini already, uh, or Midjourney uh, or Stability Diffusion or any of the tools out there. Uh, again, we'll talk a little bit around sort of prompting for, for content creation uh, and then a little bit around task automation uh, at the end uh, as well. I can see a couple of questions coming in um, uh, already. Maybe we can pick these up. Um, Jamie, I'll pick your question up towards the end. I think it is a very good question um, around some of the risks with AI. Um, uh, and another attendee, uh, dis dis distinguishing between fact and fiction with this, um, there is a lot of skepticism around AI. I dare say that 2023 was the peak of uh, inflated expectations. If you're familiar with Gartner's hype cycle, we're probably crashing a little bit into the trough of disillusionment, people realizing that maybe AI is not everything that is cracked up to be, but it's an incredibly fast moving space. Uh, and I think that it's a technology that is here to stay. Uh, it is going to, in many ways, revolutionize the world, um, much like the internet did, much like mobile did, AI really is the next wave, uh, next disruptive wave. Um, there is, of course, going to be a lot of hype around it. Um, but again, you know, going in with an open mind, but also being very critical thinking, I think, is really, really key here as well. It's not a silver bullet uh, that's going to save everything for you. Um, but yeah, hopefully I would love to hear more thoughts around that uh, as we go. So let's talk a little bit about conducting research, first of all. Um, now, again, you know, if you're setting out to design uh, uh, some kind of uh, Piece of piece of learning content, um, you know, maybe some soft skills training for manager onboarding, or or for you know dealing with conflict or creating psychological safety in teams. Uh, AI could be really powerful here uh, as a tool to really help you go out and kind of uh, find that information on those topics. So a couple of things here that really a couple of tools that I really like to use. So Google Gemini, um, which of course was Bard, uh, they recently rolled that all into Gemini just last week. Uh, ChatGPT4, of course, and then Grammarly Pro. So a couple of things that you can do here. Um, one of the things I like to do when I'm trying to analyze trainer needs um, is to create a quiz. So if you're trying to identify um, how what people know or how they feel around a specific topic, you may have in the past custom come up with some type of survey uh, or some kind of, you know, some kind of grading system using a Likert scale. You know, it's like in my team, I feel like this, you know, strongly agree to strongly disagree. Uh, now, of course, that can be done um, pretty easily with things like Bard uh, or Gemini there um, or GPT-4. Um, you can also uh, often use if you're a GPT-4 uh, premium subscriber, which costs about 20 US dollars a month, uh, it will allow, it will connect to the internet uh, and you can use it as a kind of research assistant for you. The other tool that I like to use a lot kind of in research uh, is Grammarly. Now, Grammarly is not a new tool. Um, they're obviously enabling lots of AI features into it at the moment. One of the features I love, and I'll talk about it in just a moment, uh, is, of course, the plagiarism checker, um, which will allow you to dump content in and for it to sort of use AI to search the Internet to check whether that information is fresh uh, or whether perhaps it's been recycled from somewhere else. So if you're doing, trying to do training needs analysis, uh, these are some useful prompts uh, that you might like to try. So one could be creating a quiz on something, like I mentioned before. Uh, I'd like you to create a quiz, 20, 10 questions around a specific topic um, using the, the Likert scale. Uh, you can dump that into one of the text to text generators. Again, GPT-4, Google Gemini, Claude, uh, and it'll actually spit out something for you. Um, if you're one of the organizations lucky enough to um, already be trialing Microsoft Copilot, uh, you'll see this also being integrated into their suite uh, of tools pretty, pretty, um, pretty rapidly, actually. Uh, and if you are using their online version, you can actually link that straight into Microsoft Forms. So with a few prompts, create a quiz, you can have launched a Microsoft Form straight away, and then you can deploy that form out uh, across. Uh, analogies are a really good, uh, I think, learning tool, particularly if you're dealing with subject matter that you're not particularly familiar with. So you might be dealing with a particularly technical concept. 
Uh, I often like using these tools to ask it to give me an analogy to explain a particular situation to me. Um, or like you see the last prompt there, explain it to me like I'm five. Uh, this is a really good one. Uh, sometimes, again, if you're struggling to grasp the technical concept and you're trying to put it back into layman's terms. Uh, the other thing I love when uh, using AI to conduct research is asking it to help apply it to a real life situation. So could you give me an example of what this would look like um, uh, to, to, to try and bring or to try and illustrate the point that I'm creating here? Again, these tools are incredibly powerful. You do need to fact check them. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about Gemini um, and maybe why that is superior to ChatGPT in terms of fact checking. Um, and of course, some of the risks there, but hopefully a couple of ideas there that can really help you uh, just get going um, with this idea of conducting research. The other tool I mentioned a moment ago, of course, is Grammarly Pro. Um, Grammarly is a freemium model, so you're probably using it already to, you know, to when you're drafting emails, to check your grammar, et cetera. Um, but if you are a premium subscriber, they do have a plagiarism function in there, um, which can be really useful, um, particularly if you're taking a direct copy and paste from, um, from a GPT output uh, and you just want to check where it's come from, um, or if someone has emailed some content to you uh, and you're not sure whether that is original content or whether it's something where they've used AI, Grammarly can be quite a useful tool here uh, as well. And once again, we can share the link to, to Grammarly Pro uh, in the chat there uh, as well. Uh, Jamie, in answer to your question there, um, including on your prompt to build a Microsoft form. So again, it depends if you have access to Copilot. Uh, if you don't already, there are a few hacks and workarounds to this um, where you can get GPT to output in a specific, or get ChatGPT to output in a specific way, copy and paste that into Word. Uh, and if you're using Word online, you can then use uh, Word to auto-populate a form. We can't do a live demo of that today. It is actually part of our AI and L&D course. Uh, going through that as a manual process. Um, but again, a little bit of playing around will hopefully uh, help you have a play with that as well. Great. That's a little bit there around sort of training needs analysis. Again, we're really just scratching the surface. There's a lot that you can do with this technology um, to, to play around with these types of things. Um, but a couple of thought starters there to get you going. Let's talk now a little bit around content summarization. Um, so again, you know, you may have done some needs analysis, you might have come up with some ideas for your training. Now you actually want to go out and do some research um, and you want to actually uh, crunch some of that into some meaningful sort of insights uh, that you can take away. So a couple of tools here that we're going to talk about. Um, so Claude, uh, which of course is Anthropic's answer to um, ChatGPT. One of the reasons uh, Claude is gaining popularity uh, is its ability to upload documents without having a premium subscription. So with ChatGPT, of course, on the free version, you can only use GPT 3.5. Uh, GPT 4 is the one that will allow you to upload full documents uh, and summarize those. So if you're not willing to pay for that, I strongly encourage you to check out Claude uh, by Anthropic. It will allow you to upload a PDF or a PowerPoint document uh, and ask the large language model to summarize that for you. Scholarcy, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in a moment. And then another little tool um, which I've come across recently, which I'll also demonstrate, is YouTube Summary, which is a Chrome plugin. So a couple of things here. You know, again, when you're summarizing content, you might be want to be creating sort of session plans or learning outcomes. Uh, and you're trying to distill a lot of information down into something uh, that is much more concrete. Now, of course, there's a bit of a Venn diagram here. You might have some training needs analysis that gives you some data on ton of what your learners need. And then there's a sea of information um, on the topic that you're trying to teach them on and you're trying to identify the point between the two. Um, again, you know, if you just dump a lot of this information into the large language models, they can really crunch the information into you. Again, identifying the skill needs gaps uh, and then still identifying the, um, the sort of subject matter expertise that you're bringing in uh, as well. Um, like I said, GPT-4 uh, is brilliant at this. If you have a premium subscription, if you don't, definitely check out Claude. Uh, I see a good question in here around privacy settings. Um, now, GPT-4 and Claude are both open LLMs, meaning anything that you dump into them, uh, your input could be the next person's output. Um, in GPT-4, uh, you do have an option to disable that. Uh, if you're a paid subscriber, it won't save your chats. 
Um, at the same time, it won't save your information. My general word of advice here is that you should not be pasting anything that is sensitive company data into an open source LLM. Uh, you may in your company be in discussions around having an enterprise version uh, of a GPT, uh, which would be a closed sandbox version, uh, which uh, of course means that you can do a little bit more of that. Um, I would tend to say that if you're dumping in you know, needs analysis or anything like that, strip any sort of uh, confidential data out of that before you dump it into the LLM. Um, I'm also going to come back to Jamie's question. Uh, actually, no, I'll come back to Jamie's question in just a little bit. Um, we, because uh, I think it is a really good question, Jamie, um, that uh, we, we we will answer. So let's take a little look. Uh, I'm just going to show you quickly Scholasi in action. Um, Scholasi is a tool which is brilliant for if you're trying to do much more academic research. Uh, once again, it's a freemium um, subscription. I'm just going to bring this across, so hopefully you can all see it. Okay. Apologies, because I'm having technical issues now. Let's kill that for a moment. Brilliant. So hopefully you can all see my screen here now. Now, Scholasi, um, like I said, it is a uh, it is a it is a platform you have to pay for. One of the things I love about it is you can basically upload white papers into it. So here's an AI and education white paper uh, that was published by Intel very recently. I can drop that into Scholasi. Um, we'll give it a moment here, uh, and it will do a brilliant job of kind of summarizing and creating a synopsis of this white paper for me. Um, it will also allow me to create flashcards uh, that, again, we can then dump into other AI tools um, to try to summarize uh, the information better. Um, so this is a very, very lengthy kind of 25-page white paper. Uh, again, it's going to give me a nice key summary here, some concepts. I will link me out to the to sort of... Uh, sources that it's referencing for these different concepts. It gives me an abstract of it, uh, a synopsis. It will actually go through um, and pull out specific highlights from that white paper that might be um, interesting to me. Uh, and of course, some conclusions and summarizing references, et cetera. Uh, so really useful tool there if you're trying to summarize quite hefty sort of um, um, white papers or academic papers uh, out there as well. The other tool that I wanted to show off quickly, and this is just one that I discovered recently, which I think is really cool. Uh, it is a Chrome plugin called YouTube Summary, um, which we will share the link to uh, in the chat. Uh, my apologies, having tech issues here again. Let's just try and get that set back up. Um, if you um, are like me and you like watching a lot of videos, um, on YouTube, particularly like TED Talks uh, and that type of thing. Um, this is a really useful Chrome plugin. Um, basically, you just need to go to the App Store and install it on Chrome. We'll share the link to the chat in the chat again. Uh, but then essentially, if I go to YouTube uh, and I search for anything, so let's say Brene Brown, Sympathy versus Empathy, one of my favorite Brene little shorts here, uh, and I load this up, you'll see this plugin on Chrome will open up on the right immediately it will transcribe the video for me, okay? So that's the first thing. I can see a full transcription of the video. Um, it will also allow me to summarize, uh, summarize what's in the video, or I can just copy and paste that transcript out. If I copy and paste that transcript out and I go into something like ChatGPT, um, obviously a little bit more powerful, I can say something like, give me three key takeaways uh, from this uh, video transcript. Dump it in there, uh, and then of course that ChatGPT um, will give that to me pretty pretty straight straight away. Um, four key qualities of empathy, um, perspective taking, staying out of judgment. I mean, I know this video almost word for word. Recognizing emotion in others, communicating uh, and understanding. Uh, so again, if you're watching long TED talks and you really just want to try and get the summary of things, uh, definitely check out this uh, Chrome plugin. Uh, it's a really cool little tool um, that can allow you to summarize content. Uh, as well. Cool. Let that keep running. Uh, I'm going to jump back into my, my PowerPoint here. Uh, again, keep the questions coming, you know, comments or thoughts, if there's anything you're curious to hear a little bit more about, um, or want us to reshare any links, uh, please just drop those into the Q&A and we'll pick those up. All right, content creation. This is a really big one. Um, and Jamie, this is probably the chance for me to come back to your question here. 
Um, obviously, there's loads and loads of stuff that we can do with content creation. Um, there is literally, I read the other day, something like 10,000 AI tools now for, for content creation. Um, when we think about prompt engineering, um, which is the idea of, of putting text into some type of generative AI system to try and get some type of output, uh, there's some key sort of things here that you can produce. So text being the obvious one. Um, so again, tools like GPT-4 uh, or Claude uh, or Gemini will allow you to do that. Image creation, uh, so Dolly, which is now integrated into chat GPT-4 or tools like Midjourney or Stability Diffusion, really good for generating images. Video creation, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Synthesia in a moment. Um, they're one of the fastest growing scale-ups in the UK at the moment. Also Runway um, for allowing you to generate videos. And then there's loads of other AI generation tools out there as well. One that I've been playing around with recently is called Framer. Uh, and I'll show you how that works uh, in just a second. Crafting a good prompt uh, is really essential. Um, and we're not gonna go deep into sort of prompt engineering in the workshop today, in, in this particular session, but I just wanna give you some good guidance kind of when you're thinking about prompting any of these tools, regardless of the output that you're trying to get. So the first thing is around specificity. Yep, the more specific you can be in asking the tool what you need, uh, the better um, it will be uh, at being able to respond to that. So often I will say, imagine you are an L&D professional, you're trying to create learning outcomes for a session on psychological safety geared at middle level managers. Uh, these session outcomes should adhere to Bloom's taxonomy. Um, I would like them to hit this particular level. So again, the more specific that you can be, uh, the more, um, the more uh, effective the output will actually be. The second thing is around context. You know, sharing examples. Uh, again, if you're using one of the LLMs that's connected to the internet, you might want to point it at a particular resource. You know, you might want to copy and paste something across, like this is what we've done pre previously. Uh, the more context you can give the system, uh, again, the better output that you'll get. Prioritize. Don't try and ask it to do it all in one hit. Um, these models are designed to be conversational. Um, so start to ask it for little bits of information, or sometimes even tell it, don't actually generate the content until I instruct you to do so. I'm going to keep giving you context. I'm going to keep giving you information. Um, and then once you've given it all of that, then you can ask it to actually do some output for you. Um, applying critical thinking, um, I think, is really key here. Uh, so remember that you are the expert. Um, the, you know, these, these tools are going to give you kind of maybe 70 or 80% uh, of what you need. Um, but you probably really want to think about what it is that, um, you know, you need to apply that human lens back over the top of it um, to avoid everything becoming homogenous and also to challenge it uh, as well. Um, Jamie, you mentioned earlier around the idea of like hallucinations, um, bias and data quality. There are, of course, real considerations here. Um, if you're using Google Gemini, it uh, does have a very useful facts check feature. Um, so again, if you're looking for sort of stats or something to try and support an argument, I would steer away from tools like ChatGPT or Claude and use Google Gemini. Uh, you can click a button down the bottom. It will then search the uh, AI's response to something and actually reference it and fact check it properly on the internet and flag things that might be incorrect. Uh, and continuous iteration, I think, is really key as well. We talk a lot about this idea of prompting being a bit like a club sandwich. Um, the idea is that, you know, you're the bread, the AI is the filling. Uh, so you kind of need to give it a piece of bread, get some responses back from it, give it another piece of bread in terms of pushing the prompt further. Uh, again, receiving something back from it, giving another piece of bread and so forth. So really this idea of human uh, and machine working together. Again, if you're interested in prompt engineering, uh, it is a key part of our programs. We have some really useful frameworks that help you structure prompts uh, for various tasks, including those uh, in the world of L&D. When it comes, however, to creating other types of content, um, so again, uh, image creation, a whole topic and we're not going to dive into today, but I want to share a couple of other tools with you. Uh, if you are required to create instructional videos, uh, Synthesia uh, is a really brilliant tool. Uh, it will allow you to essentially use AI to generate a script and then will create an avatar for you uh, and actually export the video um, for you. To give you an idea of this in action, I just got a little video. Welcome here. to this video on understanding Herzberg's theory. Let's dive into one of the most widely known theories of job satisfaction and dissatisfaction and discover how it can guide your employee retention strategies. So what exactly is Herzberg's theory? 
also known as the two-factor theory, it argues that job satisfaction and dissatisfaction stem from two distinct sets of factors. On one hand, there are hygiene factors such as salary. Now, this is not a perfect video by any means, but this is something you can generate in about half an hour playing around with a tool like Synthesia. Uh, and obviously this technology is rapidly advancing. Uh, also incorporating the ability to, to clone people. So um, recording a short piece of video content with someone, then asking uh, the platform to actually recreate that person uh, for you. Maybe a little bit scary for some people. Um, but yeah, definitely be playing around with these tools. You know, if you spend a lot of your time kind of in the studio, just filming compliance type training, uh, maybe a platform like Synthesia uh, could be a really short, really, really effective uh, gateway to bridge that. <clears throat> The second tool that I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit, uh, and again, we'll share these links uh, in the chat with you, um, but it's Runway. Uh, Runway has, if you think about 2023 as the year of kind of text to image generation, uh, of course, Dolly, uh, OpenAI's version, you know, Mid Journey, I mean, how far they came in 12 months is absolutely insane. Uh, we're now seeing that happen with video. So Runway is really leading the pack here, um, being able, allowing you to use to on a few simple text prompts to generate some incredibly photorealistic photo uh, video content. Uh, so again, if you're looking for, you know, if you're typically using um, platforms like Getty to try and look for, you know, video uh, generic stock images uh, or generic sort of uh, video content that you can splice into uh, existing educational materials, you may actually find that a tool like Runway uh, will do a better job for of that for you because you can be incredibly specific about what you want to be in the video uh, and the format that it is. And again, uh, there's a lot of information out there. There's, there's a whole skill to learn prompting these tools, uh, but it's something worth checking out if you are keen to do that as well. The other one I'd suggest is Pika Labs, um, also sort of battling with Runway uh, at the moment to try and get to, to the top of the pile, both of them um, being backed by huge VCs, so huge amounts of investment. I say that 2024 is gonna be the year of text to video, um, generative AI. So pretty exciting stuff. Another tool that I love, and I just like sharing this one because I think it's a bit of fun, uh, but again, to show you how powerful AI is, if you need to build a website, Framer, framer.ai. Um, we'll drop the link in the chat there as well. Literally off one prompt, uh, you can build uh, an entire website. Um, so, I mean, again, if you just want to get a feel of what generative AI is capable of, I uh, strongly recommend, again, just go out and uh, have a look and a play with these tools if you want to see what their capabilities are. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and just, yeah, again, curiosity uh, is probably the key thing, uh, key thing here as well. Brilliant. So let's lastly talk about task automation. Um, and again, a huge bucket of things that we can do here as L&D uh, professionals. Um, but I just want to share a couple of tools that I'm really, uh, I really love using at the moment. Um, interesting comment here. I tried creating training poster by GPT-4, but the outcome wasn't in English. Yes, it is one thing uh, that uh, the large language models still struggle to do, which is recreating uh, English characters. Um, I suspect that's going to change uh, in the next few months. Uh, I was reading a report the other day uh, that said that uh, stability diffusion is leading the race um, at the moment when it comes to uh, anything that requires sort of uh, written English uh, on the posters, but again, kind of early days. But interestingly, you've had to play with that. Um, again, probably better just trying to create some more generic images that you can then overlay your own text onto uh, at this current stage. So. All right, in terms of task automation, so again, just a few tools I want to talk about here. Um, Otter AI is a bit of a game changer for me. Um, it is brilliant uh, if you attending loads of meetings and you're typically someone who wants to just take loads of notes in the meetings, uh, it will allow you, it will actually come in and join the meeting for you. Um, you don't need to do anything other than link it to your calendar. Again, it's a freemium subscription, um, but it will transcribe the meeting and summarize it for you. It'll also listen out for actions if there's a PowerPoint shared in the meeting, it will take screen grabs of it. Um, obviously, if you're going to use something like Otter, um, it's good to inform the people that you're with that that is your AI pilot in the meeting. Uh, but like I said, it's super easy to use. Uh, it links into your calendar. It will just automatically join your Zooms uh, or the meetings that you are attending um, and, and do that for you. 
The um, the other thing I wanted to talk a bit around here around task automation, of course, is the ability to build a custom GPT. Now, a custom GPT, again, this is a function of GPT-4, a very, very powerful function of GPT-4. Um, you won't be able to access this unless you are a premium subscriber. Um, but essentially, if we go up here uh, into Explore GPTs, we have the ability to create our very own GPT. So this is our own large language model. Um, again, just using simple prompts. Now, like we said before, I'd be very careful with uploading any sensitive information into this, um, but this will allow you to effectively, um, I'd like you to build a chatbot to service clients on my website at www.edify.co.uk. Cool. The GPT builder will then start to actually build a GPT for me. Uh, and then you can preview and play with it on the right-hand side of the screen here. Um, now, obviously this takes a bit of time. You can upload data into it uh, or other kinds of documents. Um, of course, I've done the hard work on this already. I've built uh, a number of different GPTs for Edify. Uh, so if I am trying to write copy um, to go on my blog or to promote webinars uh, or across my website, website this GPT understands our tone of voice, our language, types of programs that we offer. So it means I don't have to prompt it with all of this information each time. I can actually use my own kind of private GPT uh, to actually do this. So really fantastic, uh, really fantastic tool there. Again, primitive days. You can also explore the GPTs that other people have created. So OpenAI recently launched uh, their own uh, sort of GPT store where people can monetize GPTs that they've built. Um, so again, if you're finding ChatGPT to be a little bit too generic for you, uh, there's a lot of crap in here, but there is some really good stuff uh, as well that you can check out. If you're building a custom GPT, um, I think it's very important. Um, a couple of ideas that you can, can do here. So one would be a chatbot, which could answer student queries. Uh, again, you need to talk to your IT team about integrating that into your uh, intranet or into your LMS. Um, Self-service for learner pathways. So again, if you fill the GPT up with information about all the different training materials that you've got um, and different programs that offer and the library of sort of e-learning that you've got out there, uh, you could allow students to self-service. Um, and of course, like I just demonstrated before with you with the Eddie guide, um, it, you know, it can help you build training materials that are really on brand for your company. Um, if you've trained it on your tone of voice, your language, the way that you talk, uh, et cetera, as well. Good question here on Zoom AI. Um, Zoom, I mean, I love the platform Zoom. I feel like they launch loads of great tools. They do also have a summary, um, like a Zoom summarizer uh, feature now, which is kind of does what Otter does. I think Otter is much better at it. Uh, Zoom's kind of like a bit like a Swiss army knife. I always feel like they launch sort of new features, um, but there's kind of other tools out there that, that do it better for me. Um, particularly for me, um, working with many different clients, jumping from Microsoft Teams to Google Meet to Zoom, uh, et cetera, using something like Otter uh, tends to be uh, a little bit more, um, a little bit more sort of beneficial for me. Brilliant. So, I mean, we've, again, like I said, we really just scratched the surface here. I've hopefully introduced you to some interesting tools um, for conducting research, um, whether that's on your own trainers, or sorry, on your own, on your students or on your employees or what you're trying to train on, summarizing content, of course, with Scholarsi, um or Claude there, a little bit around prompt engineering, uh, if you're trying to use AI to generate content, and a couple of tools there that I really love um, when it comes to kind of automating tasks. If you're in, you know, you're interested in learning a little bit more about AI, um, specifically in the world of Alan D., um, we have recently built a program which is specifically uh, geared around this. Uh, our AI for L&D program is um, really designed for L&D teams to help uh, apply this way of thinking and this way of working with the machine to solve specific L&D challenges. Uh, it is a six-week program. Uh, it is based around the ADDI model. So I'm sure many of you here are familiar with ADDI as a learning design framework. Uh, but really thinking about how can you use AI tools like the ones I've discussed today, but more specifically, what are the right prompts and the right frameworks and the right methodologies to use these tools in each of the five stages of ADDI? So firstly, looking at analyzing, so using AI to create training needs analysis or automate that across the forms, deploying surveys, crunching uh, your own kind of internal learning data. 
using AI to design sessions, uh, so defining learner needs, uh, writing session plans and session outcomes, using AI to develop content, again, facilitation guides, um, infographics, uh, instructional design, um, PowerPoint decks, you know, video content, et cetera. Uh, using AI for implementation, so maybe building out things like FAQs or using AI to assess the quality of your training materials uh, against the learner needs to make sure that it's kind of matching it. Things like translation into different languages. Uh, of course, AI is a very powerful tool there. Uh, and then lastly, an evaluation. So using AI to do sort of formative assessments, uh, really understanding the impact of your learning. Um, like I said, it's 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 a six-week program. Uh, it runs across a variety of different sprints. Um, which, you know, if you're interested in having a little bit more of a chat with me about this program, um, or indeed just a chat about AI in the world of L&D, uh, you can reach out to me uh, directly. We'll share the link. Uh, we'll share my email address in the chat uh, if that interests you. We ran this, pro this program recently with Publicis, um, of course, the big media company. A uh, couple of key stats here. They, they wanted to put 27 of their global L&D people through the program. Um, to over the course of six weeks to try and expedite the way that they were building like materials in their local resource in, in their local regions. Uh, the two key stats here for me is that after the six weeks, 100% of participants said that it directly impacted their productivity. We asked them about a month later by how much, uh, and they said on average four and a half hours a week, um, which is a phenomenal sort of cost uh, and resource savings. So again, if you wanna find out more about this, uh, or the program, or you want to have a chat with me, um, you can uh, simply drop me an email um, or scan this QR code that we popped up on the screen or click the link that Louise was about to share in the chat, uh, and that will um, connect us so we can continue the conversation. We also have a super helpful AI and L&D cheat sheet. Um, so if you would like access to this, uh, it's something that myself, uh, one of our key collaborators, Martin Talks, have put together sort of, again, looking at the Addy model and giving you some specific prompts that you can copy and paste. If you'd like access to the L&D cheat sheet, again, drop me an email uh, or fill out the form uh, and we'll share that with you uh, as well. There's no pressure, of course, to, to even meet with me. We will share that across with you. That kind of brings us um, to our time. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to stick around for another 10 minutes or so if there are further questions uh, or comments. Um, Jamie, I kind of answered your question earlier, um, hopefully um, giving you a couple of things. There is obviously a lot of IP considerations around um, large language models creating content. And again, we have frameworks and governance uh, advice around that, probably a bit heavy for us to get into uh, in the class today. But if you're interested in having a chat about that uh, and some of the specialists that we work with, that can really help um, help trying to lay down the right processes for using AI, uh, definitely reach out uh, and we can answer that uh, as well. Um, yes, we will record the sharing. Um, and I think I also answered the question there around um, privacy settings. Yeah, like I said, if unsure, probably don't paste confidential information into the LLM. Um, unless there's any other questions, I guess that brings us to the end of the session. Um, thank you so much to everyone that joined us. I know it's a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, hopefully gave you a couple of ideas, um, or a couple of tools that you can go and look at straight away. Uh, very much um, look forward to connecting um, with you uh, if you want to continue the conversation. I mean, I love talking about uh, technology changing the way that we do things. Like I said, um, having learned how to use uh, these AI tools for L&D tasks, I'll never go back to doing them the old way uh, again. So um, definitely, definitely be curious, definitely start playing around with them. Uh, Jamie, I'm not sure what you mean by digital adoption platforms integrating AI. Maybe if you can elaborate a little bit on that for me. Um, it seems like every tool out there at the moment is currently integrating um, Integrating AI, uh, even platforms like LinkedIn and Instagram and stuff now seem to have AI baked into them, um, often using one of the open APIs, open AI obviously being the big one out there, Claude, uh, who Amazon recently acquired, uh, also kind of leading the race. Um, it's just, you're just it's, we're, we're on the tip of a tsunami. Um, it's gonna keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. So like I said, um, it's definitely something to keep, um, watching out on uh, as well. A digital adoption platform is step learning with tools. 
There are some out there. Uh, Jamie, again, I'd encourage you to do your own research. It's very, very fast moving space. Um, uh, again, talk with your IT department about maybe integrating an enterprise license of something like GPT into your CRM. Um, it is all very, very possible, um, but something that probably should be led by the tech team. Brilliant. Unless there's any other questions, we might um, we might call it quits there. Again, thank you for those who are still hanging on and who've joined us. Um, hopefully informative. Uh, definitely reach out uh, if you'd like to have more of a chat. Um, would really love to um, uh, yeah continue the conversation with you. Hope you have a lovely Wednesday and we will talk again soon. Bye for now.